very extremely happy to start with Amenso today and thank you so much for uh, accepting our invitation to be a part of this uh, experiment. Um, maybe some of you know us from um, the Prism Lecture Series and um, this is a form of, uh, we are still using the idea of a prism, you know, through a prism you can look at one thing from different angles, from different perspectives. But through the prism, you can also look at one thing and find many aspects within it. And this is what we are trying to do here uh, with Elamenso and with this first Elamenso, Leda, the choice play of governance. So we're trying to uh, think together with the different uh, stakeholders on various fields and trying to bring reflective thinking as a major tool uh, to think of society today. <laughs> and uh, all of these words are indeed um, at the heart of our inquiry today. Um, we know us as Data Foundation for Translocal Initiatives. Well, this was an initiative uh, and we are uh, moved by the energy that makes this kind of event possible. Uh, actually, along with us, we had South Asian University and FINE in uh, Europe. Um, and this is clearly translocal. You see, we are bringing people from different places of the world, uh, different places within India, with different languages. We're talking about Lila, but we're also talking about the play. Um, and we are bringing different people from various disciplines. Mm -hmm. <coughs> and indeed, this play, Lila. So, if we are um, thinking in terms of play, uh, in terms of a cosmic play, do we still have a space for choice? Uh, can we still take decisions? Or is it just all mapped out already? We will try to reflect on this tonight. Um, we are hoping that this shows that we can have public moments, moments with, with various audiences where we can all participate and reaffirm the possibility of having deep intellectual engagements in the public sphere, not just for certain audiences, not even just with universities, but um, with the whole society. We are very happy tonight to have uh, Adrian Navigante from uh, FIND, the India-Europe Foundation for New Dialogues. He has come with the, the honorary president of the foundation, Jack Kloarek. We are very happy to have uh, Devdata Saha uh, from the South Asian University, the president of South Asian University. He's also here tonight, Kavita Sharma. Thank you so much for our invitation. And Naftesh Johar from Abhyas, Delhi, will also be part of the discussion. I'll leave it to Kavita Sharma to say a few words. Then Jacques Kouarek, Rizio, and finally we'll enter the discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much and good evening to everybody. Welcome to South Asian University. And I must compliment that all of you are here in spite of the heavy rainfall. At least in New Delhi it's not so bad as in Noida. It was just raining cats and dogs. My unqualified apologies for having got a few minutes late. I'm very, very happy that uh, we have uh, started to collaborate with an organization, a thinking organization like Leela. And uh, I think this is our third? Second, this is second. This is the second in the series. We hope to have many more. Last time we had. Uh, uh, to a, a session essentially on literature, poetry, and then there were excerpts from readings from a novel. I'm very happy to welcome you from FIND. And as it was said, yes, it's certainly a translocal, a transnational, transcontinental um, kind of an enterprise. I'm very intrigued by this, the choice of Leela, the choice play of governance. Being a student of Mahabharata, the whole Mahabharata turns on the game of dice. And why does it turn on the game of dice is a very interesting thing. Well, the, um, the, the, uh, who is the heir to the throne 
has become so entangled because for the uh, before the actual war takes place, for about four generations, there is no clear-cut air. The, the first sun has not succeeded. And that is what has made the whole scheme so tangled that it can only be, only be resolved through a game of dice. And it is interesting that the king is part of his Raj Surya, that is his, uh, his proclamation of emperorship is supposed to play a game of dice. Now, why is he supposed to play a game of dice? Probably because the element of chance. It is chance that governs our lives. And so a person in authority, a person in position of governance must be able to deal with chance, the unexpected. So probably that's why it is necessary to play that game of dice. And Yudhishthir proves completely incapable of dealing with the unexpected and loses. And that is why perhaps he has to go to the forest to actually learn kingship. And we find that uh, unlike his previous sojourn forest, this time he, had, he goes to the various wise people, the rishis, and he takes lessons in governance and ethical governance. And so, of course, I'm without elaborating further on it, so when I got this when I got this title, I was very intrigued by it because obviously anybody who does any governance or administration knows that most of it is chance. You plan in a particular way and then it just disentangles. And you have to think on your feet to see how it can go. Or it may go in a completely different direction. That different direction may not seem a very happy one to you. And later on, it may, you may find that it actually fits into the larger scheme of things that you have not seen through. So chance is a very interesting thing. And of course, we won't go into, and I'm sure many of you here will take it up. What is chance? What is destiny? Is it the same as destiny? Is it the same as inexplicable time, which is both eternal and momentary? What is this chance? And how much of freedom do we have? Or is it only an apparent? So, uh, with these few thoughts, I will leave it to Rizio for uh, further. Or would you like to first? Yeah, Professor I have my own. Ladies and gentlemen, it is with a great pleasure that we came to Delhi in order to participate in the first event of the Philosophy. Philosophical Banner of the Lila Foundation, Lila Menso. I would like to thank Rizio Yohanan and Samuel Bouchoul, with whom Fine is already collaborating with a view of a new intellectual project in the year to come for the kind invitation to be part of this event. I take this opportunity to say a few words about the India Europe Foundation for New Dialogues before I pass the word to Adrienne Arigante, my collaborator. <coughs> my interest and this deep respect for the Indian culture dates back to the time I worked with Alain Danielou, the founder of the institution I represent. It was a collaboration of more than 30 years, which left many fruits still to be reaped through the kind of work we are do doing now. Alain Danielou spent more than 20 years in India. He experiences the Indian religion from the inside, being initiated into Shivaism by a very learned pundit and sannyasi of Varanasi called Swami Karpatri. Studied its philosophy, its language, like Sanskrit, Hindi, Tamil, and its traditional arts, especially its music. During a recent sojourn in Varanasi, I was glad to confirm that Danielu is nowadays regarded by many Indians as an authority and, and even a classic in matters of musicology. This evening, Adrian Navigante will tell you something about this philosophic soul, which is also a very rich and stimulating subject for discussion. It is very clear that it's for discussion because many people are not completely in agreement with, well, with the way Danielou is uh, acting and uh, speaking of India. 
The India Europe Foundation was created in 1970 by Alain Danielou himself in order to prom promote different aspects of Indian culture in the West. Trying to do justice to its name, it is our wish to establish a permanent, dynamic and substantial dialogue between India, which all the plurality and diversity that this world connotes, and the Western world. In consonance with this idea, we are working on the opening of a center in India to be coordinated with our activities in Europe. We are, for the time being, much more Eurocentric. This is something that cannot be done without the participation and support of local people. Of course, we are not doing things without the participation of the Indian. You are an uh, uh, old civilization not to be uh, imposing system to you. Uh, that is the reason why uh, the collaboration with an inter intercultural foundation like LILA is in this sense very welcome, also in the frame of this expansion project that, in my opinion, can only bring beneficial results to all the people involved in it. A visit to our website will permit you to know more about our activities and purposes. Wishing you a very stimulating working session of Lila and so I thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you. Thank you, Chef, and thank you. Uh, I'll just uh, open this screen by kind of introducing the concept because it is, uh, you know, so that you, you have some anchor. Uh, the, we are launching a new forum. Uh, if you look, if you follow our work, you will know that there are, there are various platforms for various uh, things. And Villa Menso, Menso is a is a word from Esperanto, uh, which means uh, mind. Uh, actually, this uh, forum, which is intended for reflective thinking uh, in these times of instant gratification, like everything is so fast and everything is so you know quick. Uh, you really don't have time if you look at the media, if you look at everywhere, you have ready, ready things. So you don't have time to think uh, reflectively, associatively. So you just have, and it's all vertically you know, specializing. You know, if I am a rocket scientist, I only know rocket science. I don't appreciate poetry, I don't understand poetry. I don't understand statistics if I am an artist. Those kind of things. But that's not how life works. Like even as we sit in this room, we know that there are technological equipment in this room. There are uh, philosophers in this room. There are poets in this room. Uh, you know, life works in a very, very non-linear, um, interconnected kind of way. But our academy tends to look at things in a very, very vertical kind of manner, which has really uh, reached us uh, in a kind of pyramidal situation where on top you are a very isolated individual. So uh, our intention, Leela's, uh, uh, it's one of the founding purposes that uh, we find horizontal connections among various disciplines, various uh, cultural expressions, so that we understand the totality of life. Like we appreciate, Leela is interpreted as a luminous idea of life appreciation. So. Appreciation for us is a, is a kind of horizontal understanding and connectivity that we, we establish as we work together. So, um, and so uh, it's also important that we, we take this term from Esperanto, a language which is created in a, in a kind of associative manner. So it, it is chosen from there because we are thinking of ways of associating various uh, fields of expression, fields of knowledge. Uh, the uh, uh, one thing that I, I would like to talk about here as an introductory thing is uh, when we when we think about uh, thought, uh, people always talk, use this term new, you know, new thought, innovation, as though newness is something which is absolutely uh, cut off from the past. Like you know, so uh, uh, there is always this discourse between uh, old and the new. And as though you know, old is something which is to be discarded, and you know, so that's also old, and this is something new. And so new does not have any roots, you know. So uh, it, the idea of Leela itself is our endeavor to see how uh, uh, 
how newness is a different kind of perspective of the past. No? So how do you, uh, you can't really cut off uh, everything that you've come from or you're, you're, you've drawn from. So how do you actually interpret newness? That is, that's one concern that we have. So Leela itself, like when we are taking a very ancient idea, it's got philosophical implications, cosmic to uh, individual, uh, you know, very humdrum everyday implications. How do you actually understand this as a new concept? You know, is it like, you know, is, is it that, you know, you're completely cutting off from everything and creating something new? It may not be possible. I would like to just quote a 1919 essay of uh, T.S. Eliot, Tradition and Intuitive Talent. You know. I just want to mention this because we tend to forget many of the texts which are written and already available you know, in this whole frantic uh, search for newness. You tend to, it's almost 100 years now. And, uh, uh, you, uh, it is very seminal text which are written. We need to revisit some of these texts and even the language I find that you know, some of these people have written in such new modern language which is not even like, which you can't even find in today's media, you know, su such, such language. I just want to quote this from T.S. Eliot. The difference between the present and the past is that the conscious present is an awareness of the past in a way and to an extent which the past, past's own awareness cannot show. So it's a, it's a new type of awareness of the past. No? So uh, how, do you, how do you arrive at this awareness? That is one concern that we have. So associative thinking is one, reflective associative thinking is one mode of uh, uh, arriving at this, and this platform is for that. But uh, I would also like to talk a little bit about uh, what, what we mean by this, uh, the, cho the, the title, uh, as uh, we just said, the, the, the choice play of governance. How is this Leela connected to governance? People, we, we have a tendency to, you know, in our norm, common parlance, you know, whenever we talk about play, we say, don't play with me, okay? You know, it's not a play thing. That means, you know, in this kind of conversations that you have here, uh, and uh, without even you realizing it, you are separating serious business from play. Like as though play has nothing to do with your your matters of consequence. So how uh, is it? A, is it? A, we are we are trying to critique that that thing to see how how this can be. But look at play actually. No, play is one activity that you are deeply engaged in. I mean, you don't have, you don't need compulsions to, to, to really go and play because you enjoy it. You are deeply engaged. But at the same time, you know that it is a, it is play. So there is a certain kind of detachment, even <coughs> as you are completely engaged in play. There is a certain kind of detachment. So uh, this is, we are curious about this. I think governance in this kind of detachment engagement is something which is a value that we want to bring into the thing, governance thinking. That is one thing. The second thing is that uh, I, you know there is a there is a an understanding of the play field in order to have a, an aptitude for playing. Like you know you you in a play field, how do you take decisions? You have to immediately make decisions. Like you have to. You are team playing, so how do you actually pass the ball to not to this guy but to that guy? You know, you are taking a decision. You know, it's almost a reflex with you. It's an aptitude that you develop in over a period of time. So, in order to reach that level of uh, understanding and play, smooth play, you really need to know your play field. You really need to know the the, the connections that exist on a play field. So. If the discontinuities that we see in the field of governance, I think we are attributing to this non-understanding of the play field. Knowledge is a problem. You know? So you have to really know the play field. And you also have to know the connections that exist in the play field. So this is the choice play of governance, that the, the value that we are bringing here. So with that, I would uh, like to invite Adrian, Marquette, and Vidata. Uh, to take this discussion forward. We will start with uh, Adrian. Uh, he will talk about uh, Daniel Luce, Alan Daniel Luce's idea of play and also in the larger context of uh, Leela. Uh, uh, so it's a philosophical reflection on, on Leela. Devdatta will talk about uh, 
play in the context of game theory. Uh, she's an economist. And Le Naftej is a dancer, choreographer, yoga practitioner, rooted in physical tradition. So we will see how the body is, uh, uh, you know, body plays itself out in, uh, in our times. Thank you very much. We will shift, I mean, we will move to uh, at the end when I do. to Lila, to this uh, very difficult concept with a long uh, story in Hinduism. And I was struggling with uh, different perspectives until I, until I saw the announcement uh, of Lila, and I thought that's beautiful. We can, we can begin with a reflection uh, on the genitive, Danielou's Lila. What does it mean? So I'm going to start with that and, and to proceed with a, with a philosophical reflection. So, the uh, question is, what, what does it mean, this expression, that you lose the Lila? What can we say about that? Is it uh, that you lose appropriation of that concept? Is it that you lose transformation of the idea into a reality? We could say that of his way of living. Is it the limit itself of the term Lila? A limit embodied in Danielou's philosophical and artistic work? Is the way Danielou himself played at and with the limits of the accepted doxa about the history, significance, and range of that almost impossible term, Hinduism, because that, that is the question, what is Hinduism? Well, perhaps it is each one of those aspects, simultaneously leading to other richer and more complex combinations, and an expansion of intensities of play I'm saying playing as if on a musical instrument in consonance with a symphony of dynamic multiplicities. We don't have to forget that Danielou was a musician and he emphasized also polytheism, uh, which was strongly criticized in the West, this aspect of Indian religion. So, plurality and symphony. First uh, idea. In this sense, it seems to me <coughs> that there are two ways of neglecting and betraying Lila. The first one is to overlook what I would call a karmic filter of the limited individual involved in the cosmic field and thinking that we as individuals, each one of us, can impose his own or her own criteria upon others. That we can exert a permanent domination and rule the whole game, the whole game. So the consequences of this are religious fanaticism and a metaphysical allergy to differences. The second way of neglecting you, that seems to me, the thought that the game, that the game is wholly arbitrary, an empty field open to the imprints of our personal invention and susceptible to being governed. So this is the opposite of attitude, leading to a nihilistic destruction of everything related to tradition. These two tendencies 
I would call them unfair play. And I will tell you show uh, in the next 15 to minutes um, that then you lose uh, Lila uh, can be seen as a way of avoiding these two main tendencies. So I begin uh, with uh, first thought is then you lose Lila as the vision of Hinduism as a corpus to be played with. This is the, exactly the reverse of any reverent act against the religion or tradition. When I say corpus to be played with, because in order to play, as Rizio pointed out, one has to know the rules. You cannot play if you don't know the rules. And at the same time, the rules are always known, between very commas, known, in the immanence of the field surpassing the individual's capacity to synthesize and conceptualize. We never have the last word about the grounds of the whole field. Tanilus Nina is, as I said, a symphony of thought trying to do justice to the complexity and concretion of that which is permanently transmitted. That is, in the Indian thought, it was, it was called Sanatana Dharma. So, uh, according to the Nilu, there is neither a homogeneous block, nor something that is wholly independent of the game, the invention of something. So it's, it's a kind of very, very subtle balance. In Danilu's work, explicit references to Lila, and even an articulated treatment, based on the assumption of a macro and microcosmic, microcosmic axis of the universe, appear at a later period. Um, the, let's say that the first approach that we can find in Danielou, uh, well, he began to write, of course, uh, earlier, as he, uh, when he was in India, but after his return, he dealt with the subject more profoundly. But, what we find is, I'm going to talk about two aspects, the indirect approach to Lila in some of his books, mainly, and I'll give two examples because I, we don't have much time, uh, I would like to leave time for discussion. But the, the exam directness of this approach are to be found in a, in a monumental book that he wrote, the um, first uh, edition is an English edition, uh, which is called Hindu Politics. The book appeared in the 60s, um, in the Bollingen series, it is a very prestigious publishing house. And uh, in the first example, Danielou resorts to the Vishnu Purana in order to present an interplay between knowledge and action in the process of creation. So, interplay between knowledge and action. Knowledge taken in the sense of a cosmic awareness of the wholeness of being, an action understood as limited and limiting power are dynamically reciprocal. And the ensuing veil has a constitutive function. It enables the multiplicity of existential levels to come into being. If I were to simplify the thought, then Lou says the idea of a veil in creation is not negative. The idea of a veil enables multiplicity. So I mean pure knowledge would, if you like, if you want, would destroy the multiplicity of creation because multiplicity implies already the existence of a veil and the possibility of action. So action has come. Um, second example, Danilu relates the term Upanishad, which he translates rather freely uh, as approach, with Darshan, which he translates literally as point of view. He relates the two of them and explicitly points to the limits of individual knowledge. So, knowledge is always an approach. It's never the final word about anything because a word is already something in that. So, Darshana is in this in this sense, a very important word, you probably know in the Indian philosophy, the philosophical systems 
which are uh, which uh, bear uh, this name, and according to the Nilu, that's one of the main treasures of Hinduism, because it doesn't present reality in only one way, affirming only one point of view as the true one. Of course, you can say that on a religious level there is a truth. But the ways how, how how to express that and how to understand that from the individual perspective as well because I mean we are individuals and we create karma <laughs> and positive or negative but we create karma. So the the subject of um, uh, realization in life we were talking about that uh, uh, today Jiva Mukta that's a kind of limit to this idea of multiplicity and individual karma in a, a general, universal, socio-cosmic context. In this sense, we can say that the Nilu's exploration of some disregarded and unseen aspects of manifestation brings him close to one specific tradition in India, that is the Tantric tradition. Um, in matters of transcendence, the Nilu does not attempt to go beyond perception, to affirm something going beyond perception, but rather to expand perception. That's, that's a different approach, but still an approach that we can find in the Indian tradition, in the Indian classical tradition as well. To expand, if you uh, take a look at the root of the word Tantra, uh, uh, one accepted etymology is uh, this word Tan to expand. So, expansion of perception for somebody related, so closely related to the arts, like Daniel Wu, was something essential. And uh, so, this, this tantric element is very important in his thought, and um, this expansion um, takes place under the guidance of two things. It seems to me the first thing is a science of limits, what he calls the science of limits, there is, you can, you can say as well a sense of symbols. Danilu was somebody who um, attached a lot of importance to symbols in classical Indian religious thought. Something that is, today is fully ignored in the West, uh, well, outside of course, some scholarly circles analyzing that, and it is still to question whether these analyses are uh, adequate to also to the Indian imagination. That's an open question, also a question for discussion. But I mean, without this science of symbols, this science of limits, words like yantra, uh, mandala, uh, mandir, uh, are meaningless, you know? So you don't find the true dimension of that. So this elimination of symbol was something uh, uh, that Danilu always spoke against. Uh, and the, the, the second uh, point that seems uh, relevant here is the theory of correspondences. There is, uh, there is something, uh, I don't know whether you are aware of that in the, in the French scholarship in, uh, among Indologists, that um, since the intervention of one of them, who was very famous and worked in Pondicherry, Louis uh, Renou, uh, there, is, there is this new approach, at least in France, to the Upanishad, as a, they translate uh, Upanishad, the word Upanishad, not literally, uh, beginning with uh, Shad, with this word to sit, and uh, to be seated uh, beside uh, the master, the teacher, to, to receive um, uh, doctrine, initiation, uh, you can think of different things. But Upanishad in the sense of theory of correspondences, because of the idea of the identification of the individual with uh, the transcendental uh, truth. So, according to Danilo, this correspondence is essential also to think the arts. Um, so, that is something that seems to me also very productive. We have in the Western modern philosophy, contemporary philosophy, a very strong critique of um, idealistic schools, for example, uh, by the logical positivists, in the 20th century, uh, one of them, Alfred Ayer, who wrote a book, Language, Truth and Logic, and critici he criticizes idealistic approaches, metaphysical approaches, as the approaches of bad poets. Like he said, metaphysicians are bad poets. We have to read good poetry, I mean artists, who are not metaphysicians. 
So um, this division between uh, metaphysics and art, a very uh, widespread phenomenon in the modern Western world, uh, there is a point that Daniel Lu, uh, he reacted against that. I mean, he, he was somebody who took the arts with a metaphysical point of view. And this theory of correspondence is related to Upanishad. So he privileged some Upanishad, but that's irrelevant now. Um, I take that as a bridge. A bridge between metaphysics and arts. And um, we can think of art uh, neither as an imitation of external nature, nor as an exercise of pure individual subjectivity like the avant garde trends, or most of them in modern Western art. So, um, what is that? It's rather an analogy of the dynamic open-endedness of the whole, in, uh, in, between very commas, nature, taken as property. So this dynamic nature, which is not only the created nature, but the creating nature. That was his point of view on the art. So that's um, enough, I think, uh, about this indirect approach to Lila. I pass on to the direct approach that appears in a later book, While the Lots Play. That is the English translation of a book first uh, published in French, La Fantaisie des Dieux, La Venture Humaine, literally translated, The Fantasy of the Gods and the Human Adventure. And we have, what interests me, here is the French title, uh, which is very literally the fantasy of the gods. You know, so fantasy. This word is essential to Danilo's understanding of Lila. And uh, since we are playing with uh, different levels of reflection, uh, I think it is very good to to think for a minute about this word fantasy and to ask ourselves, what did Danielou think about? What, what did he have in mind as he wrote fantasy? Fantasy of the gods. So, uh, first, the first level of reflection is related to the language in which Danielou wrote uh, uh, this book. So, fantasy, phantasma in Greek, is today seen, nowadays seen in the, in the sense of something lacking substantial reality. Uh, but if we take a deeper historical, etymological look, we find in the same root uh, of the verb, uh, that, that the, same, the root of phantasma is the same root as the verb phine. And the verb phine in Greek, or the nominalized participle phenomenon, we, we know the word phenomenon in English, so this root indicates a coming into presence an original opening, or perhaps better, a disclosure of being, a disclosure of being. That's very important on the level of philosophical reflection. Um, and it is interesting to know that uh, a, a contemporary trend in, in, in Western philosophy called phenomenology, phenomenology takes this reflection to think about the constitution of world. There is no world without disclosure of being. You, know? you have to disclose being for the world uh, to be articulated the way we know it. So there is this first layer. Um, but of course we can think at the same time, because Danielou was practically, uh, well, he, he studied in India uh, many years. He was, uh, he affirmed to be educated rather as an Indian. As as a European uh, man, so we can think of a, a, a Sanskrit retroversion of the instead of the Greek retroversion. So, as I when, when I thought about fantasy in the case of Danielou, knowing his work, I thought about the kalpana, the word the kalpana, the word samharan, and the word pratiba. And um, it's interesting. Perhaps there are many other options, yeah? but these options have, in my opinion, a philosophical significance. And not only a philosophical significance within the field of, for example, ecological studies, but in, a, in an intercultural uh, way. Because if we take 
the, the roots of these words, especially, let's take, uh, for example, the word Samhavan. So, the root is Bhu, and that, that, is, that's, that is something that uh, struck my attention already when I, when I began to study Sanskrit in Europe, of course, that uh, this, uh, this verbal stem uh, means to be, to be in the sense of becoming, not to be in the sense of just being, static being. So it's something very particular. You, we, uh, in Europe, we are, we are used to the idea of being and becoming as opposites. That's the first <laughs> indication. And Pratibha, for example, has this root pa to appear, to, you know, to come into this uh, uh, field of, to come into sight. So, you find this parallel, these two words, to what I was saying with regard to the, to the verb finding, which is this disclosure of being, this, this coming into presence of something. Why am I saying this? Because the word fantasy of the God, presented by Danielu the way it was, has to do with the sphere of manifestation as a disclosure of being, and also with a field of dynamic interactions in plurality. When we take the word Vikalpana, we have the, an, an idea in we, of discontinuity, of something well-ordered. You know, the discontinuity of something well-ordered, in itself is not chaos. It is a movement, it is a dynamic. So we have becoming, we have disclosure of being, and we have an interruption of a continuity that would be too homogeneous to think to that. So I think these three ideas are central in Danielu's uh, approach to Lina. And I myself am of the opinion that that, is, that, that keeps a certain uh, fidelity you know, to, the, to the tradition of Indian thought. Um, there is, of course, another way in which then you approach this 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 problem, this subject, this problem, this the difficulties of the of thinking, Lila, especially articulating one aspect of the Samkhya cosmology um, using a kind of bridge, which I, I would call a tantric bridge, between the two principles, Purusha and Prakriti. So the unmanifested principle and the energetic substance of manifestation. Um, Danilu says the world appears when Purusha enters Prakriti. What he's doing there, he, he's translating a mythological image of Lingam and Dorni, but inside a philosophical system, a very complex operation, of course. But what, what uh, seems to be interesting is that, uh, in his opinion, the unstable and immaterial combination of elements identified with root manifestation already on the level of previous to the manifestation, the way we know the manifestation, this what we call in philosophy the ontic situation, at this level there is an erotic component. And there is a component of exuberance. That interests me because the traditional uh, uh, concept and notion, idea of Lila, uh, both in, in, in the Vaishnavi tradition, which is very strong, the, the, the concept of Lila is very strong in Vishnuism, but also we retain uh, the word Krida in Shaivism as well, has to do with uh, this distinction, this main distinction between an activity which is the result of effort, stemming from lack, from need, from human desire, almost <coughs> imperfect, always imperfect, uh, sorry, and the idea of the pure divine activity. How did Danilu translate that? He translated that in terms of sensual and erotic components without saying that that is the same as human desire on the level of egotistic desire and all that. What Tanya Lu said is that which is translated as bliss, anandu, 
that could be translated as well as voluptuousness, divine voluptuousness. It is an exuberance of being, you know? So, what does it mean? It means that we can have an approach to the divine as well in matters of eroticism. So that's, that's also a very strong tantric component in his thought, but it is related to the idea of not condemning the whole that comes from individual activity, individual dynamics, individual movement and interactions. Uh, a last recapitulation. Um, I would say that according to Anilu, creation is an interplay of intensities in which we have only <coughs> one possible kind of control. Not the control of the whole situation. That we, we, we will never have the control of the whole situation. It is only a modality of control related to ourselves, how we behave in the world, and what he emphasizes is the role within the whole. The role in participation. The particip it's a theory of participation. And in this sense, he was very, very critical to voluntaristic affirmations, for example, based on uh, strategy domination, uh, domination strategies, or the idea of changing a whole situation, beginning with only one individual thought, absolutely isolated from the context. Yeah? First of all, you have to understand the context. And of course, his, um, this closeness to, to Hinduism, in his case, um, meant that he, he thought, he always thought the context not only so, social context, but socio-cosmic context. So it, I mean, he, he maintained this classical uh, perspective, of, of, of perspective of classical Hinduism, which was severely criticized in Europe because of the, because of the association that socio-cosmic models are models of domination, um, hierarchy, and oppression. So, according to Daniel Lu, if you really think socio-cosmic context, uh, you have almost you know three thousand years of tradition. You have first of all to study what has been what has been transmitted there before. You, you dare to criticize that. So, I mean, he tried to reopen the socio-cosmic uh, perspective of the, of the game. So that's why Lila had um, a, a, an essential relevance uh, for him. So, um, in this sense, it has to be pointed out that increased awareness does not lead to any form of quietism, of not acting, because of the, uh, a fundamental philosophical uh, presupposition of, of the whole of the theological and ontological notion of Lila, uh, the plane or the, 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 yes, the plane, the dimension of individual existence. We cannot stop acting. I mean, you as we as individuals, we cannot stop acting. When we reflect, when we reflect, we can take some distance from uh, the immediacy of the goal-oriented uh, context of action, but we don't stop acting. That is the, uh, the uh, dimension of karma, which is constitutive of human beings. So quietism would be, in this sense, the affirmation of something beyond Lila for the sake of an end game, an end game. But of course, this something, if this something is a firm, takes once and again a form within the range of human experience. So it, it, it is automatically reintroduced in the context of this divine play. So there's no way of avoiding that. I mean, if we affirm a truth that is a cosmic that takes place beyond the cosmos, in the very instant of that affirmation, we're still playing the game from a very specific perspective. So, um, I think that uh, the problem of religion uh, and Danilu is not the religiosity of life. I mean, being religious was not the problem. 
but rather the organization of the metaphysical governance to encode life by absolutizing a single perspective. The harmony of the whole does not rule out the disharmony of its parts, that is for sure. Especially if the whole if the whole is to be conceived of as dynamic, of course, there is all, always disharmony at a certain level. But an active and generalized exercise in disharmony, for example, the affirmation of an absolute truth beginning with the only one perspective, this affirmation prevents each part from being part of a whole. So it, it prevents each one of us from being part of this whole. Uh, according to Danilo, no act of creation can be separated from the sacrificial operation. We really accept ourselves as, uh, in our finite forms as we are. And essentially, what we cannot neglect is that we all have to play an economic game. Again, where somewhere down the line, we have fiduciary responsibilities, right? We maybe just to ourselves or to our families, to our countries, to everybody in general, we do not play a Ponzi game. Again, to introduce some more economic jargon, Ponzi was a famous Italian gangster, some of my students would know that, who played an interesting game. And the game was uh, that I'll borrow money from the president of our university and I'll tell him, you know, I really need money and I take the money from her and to repay her, I would go and borrow money from Mavi, my student, and repay him. And then to keep on, I'll keep on this game of debt. Then I'll go and borrow from my post because you know me very well and we spoke at a seminar together, <laughs> talk together. So let's play a game. Unfortunately, in most circumstances, people cannot play a Ponzi game. Even Ponzi himself, the great Ponzi, was caught at his game. So when the game becomes extremely mundane and it becomes money, it is of great interest to an economist to see uh, games that we play. We open up the sphere of free will because we start from a point that we do have actions. We have strategies which we proactively, consciously choose from, leading to certain outcomes. In fact, Philosophically, the game that I will discuss, the game theory, at any given minute, a player in the game is choosing from an infinite set of possibilities. And that choice, that free will, is entirely with us. So that becomes a burden as well as a very positive way of looking at the game. So the way I look at it is we will actually play a game instead of sitting and listening to me talk. I will introduce you to a game. Uh, after I talk a little bit of game theory, uh, then I will actually get all of you guys to play a little game with me and to show you where economics and uh, our, you know, we will accept our limited perspective. In some sense, we situate our discipline in modern, current literature and economics somewhere between him and him. We accept that there are answers which we do not provide. The philosophical story of why we are playing the game, an economist is really not in a position to give. And we do not give it. And honestly, an economist will say that you know the backstory of this, probably an anthropologist or a social scientist of some other, uh, you know, or a philosopher can tell you. And some other part of why it is happening, somebody who looks at you know, maybe the brain, or studies the brain, a new branch of economics called neuroeconomics. How actually looking at money, what it does to our brain, and how we react to it. So our body is a part of the play. So I would like to situate my talk and link my talk to both these two speakers to say that I actually stand on a very limited space, and that limited space but I will try and make the most of, in a most utility maximizing way of uh, doing economics. So take it away, but I'll ask both my course speakers also to play the game after I introduce you to the rules of the game. I wish I actually had that kind of money and I could actually play the game with you, but I don't, but uh, it'll be a hypothetical game.
But this game has become at the forefront of a lot of research and has actually taken away a lot of hubri among neoclassical economics that we have the final answers, we don't. So, just to know how we go, uh, now we can probably switch the lights off while I proceed with a little bit of introduction to game theory. But uh, a, a notion of game theory is that it is a, a, some kind of a theory about any kind of game. But game theory as a theory is actually an invention of mathematicians. So game theory is actually an abstract mathematical tool. And nothing more than that. It is a device which has many applications. It has found applications in biology. It has found applications in sociology. It has found applications in international relations. And economists have jumped to it. Uh, it started with the interesting publication by von Neumann and Morgenstern, 1944, with a book, The Theory of Games and Economic Behavior. In an era of uh, the world war, where we were essentially looking at things which would immediately affect you, if essentially your own life, whether you will live or not. So when you are looking at a situation where you're looking at another army or a frigate or in the navy, let's say, you have immediate decisions that you have to take. That, you know, should we engage that other frigate or that naval warship in war? What should be our best response to this? But uh, what was devised was, uh, was written because von Neumann was a mathematician and game theory was written and largely researched also in Russia as, a, as an abstract mathematical tool. And let us note what we understand as economists, as assumptions when we say that we are looking at a game. When we say that we are looking at a game, there are certain essential components of a game. A game presumes the existence of certain agents, finite or uh, we can extend it to infinity, but typically a finite number of players, each of whom know that they are playing that same game, which is a very strong assumption, that we all have to know that we are playing that game. A set of agents who know that they are playing that game also know that actions taken by any one player has strong payoff relevance on another player. And that is what I mean by strategic interaction. No player acts in an autistic fashion. No player believes that the action I take will not immediately give rise to a counter reaction by the other player. So a game theoretic model or situation arises in any context of the social sciences when there is a set of agents with a set of payoffs from actions that they take, knowing well that any action that they take has a strategic component, which means any action taken by any player has an effect on the action chosen by the other player. The other important aspect is that each player is endowed with a set of strategies. And strategy is different from action. In the, common, in the parlance of game theory, action is a set of choices that you face at a given point of time. Strategy is contingent action. Given my current set of information or knowledge about the game, what is my action that I will take? That contingent history, which is available to every player, is the strategy of the player. So, given this, the way game theory, to give you a bit of history, progressed, had to make a theory of the mind. How? Well, because we, we have to guess at, when we are playing the game, 
how will the other guy play the game? Because I am not playing alone. I am playing a game with you. And the standard assumption which helps simplify and not open a black box about how people are thinking, how they are making these choices, was the assumption of rationality which has come under heavy criticism in the later, in the, in the current research in economics. Now, rationality has many uh, meanings and is a preloaded term. What I mean by rationality is probably not what you understand by rationality. But in the standard <coughs> understanding of uh, what, uh, you know, a play of ration, rational agents in a game would simply imply that at least agents have consistent beliefs. At least during the play of the game, agents have consistent beliefs about the game, about the playoffs, about how the game will play out, about the situations. That also has a lot of implications, but the standard game theory model started with an idea of rational agents who also are trying to maximize something. Now what exactly that maximization is, we'll again come to. But maximize some kind of optimizing behavior is going on. Okay? Either maximize or in some, it's, it's dual in some context, minimize, but definitely in most games maximize. Given something which is also called common knowledge, which technically if interpreted means that something like this, that I know that, you know the rules of the game. And the next layer of common knowledge is that I know that, you know that, I know the rules of the game. The next layer of common knowledge is that I know that you know that I know that you know the letter of the game. And this is the extent or requirement of information and common knowledge or the amount of brain activity that was needed to solve game theoretic models in simple games that you are aware of needs that kind of cognitive power which is uh, given to a brain but it was assumed and it was at the backdrop of everything we, so the subtext of this is that when all these disciplines like international relations or economics adopted this class of games, okay, which has variants in cooperative game theory or non or non cooperative game theory, I do not want to enter into that debate right now. Or whether it's a static game or a dynamic game, all of this nonetheless has this structure that it has to have this kind of common knowledge. It has to have some notion of rational, rationality among agents built into it, and the interaction has to be switched. So, if I proceed further, let us start with this ultimatum game, which I ask each of you to play. And we will test some of the assumptions of this game that um, uh, as we play on. So, it's good to play this game, I'm assuming that everybody understands English. So, I'm speaking in a language which, is, uh, which, is, uh, which all of you can understand. So the rules of the game is this, what is given 100 rupees, unit of divisibility <coughs> in 1 rupee, so 100 rupees is divisible by 1 unit, to one, unit one, 1 rupee, to you and me, we have to agree to split the amount, and I'll tell you later why this game is very important. The proposer makes an offer, the responder either accepts or rejects. If accept, the deal goes ahead and we accept the, you know, the split and the game ends. If the responder rejects the offer, then both people get zero and the game ends. Now, as agents in this game, I ask you to take on the role of both the proposer and the responder. And please, on a piece of, piece of paper, write down how much of that 100 rupees would you accept if I gave you, you know, if I or what would be acceptable to you as a, as a share to you. And how much of that 100 rupees would you propose to give to me? So both as a proposer and a responder, write down your offers and we will discuss that after you've done that. So you can switch the light on and you can please, but we keep this uh, rules of the game up here. If you have any doubts about the rules of the game, you can ask me, but this is part of the Nobel Prize winning work of Kahneman and Tversky, which is actually tweaked a lot of the ideas of game theory recently. So let's actually play the game. So let's, can we just write down, of 100 rupees, how much would you give to me? And of how much of that 100 rupees 
how much would you expect me to get? So, right. And we can have all the audience tell us, and we'll have, we will later make it very, uh, you know, we'll ask for identities and see how cross culturally this will matter, okay? Because this is a lot of things going on and sub assumptions in game theory which will be questioned when we actually play. Okay? Has everybody understood the game? Yes? And uh, my colleague uh, Ramani, a lawyer, has also written down her. You know, offer, proposal, responder. So I'll, I'll go across into the room. Can we go? I'll go up with the mic, or we can. Okay. Can you just go around and ask people to? Um, we'll do it uh, to introduce themselves. And uh, in fact, uh, one of my uh, friends from economics, Rupesmadi, why don't you do a running tab of offers? Okay. So how much what? So we have a statistical display of what's going on. So this is going to be an online, right, real-life experiment of what is going on. And uh, for a lot also, you're playing the game. Everybody's playing the game. Yeah. So we're in the game. So let's start with the very back and please introduce yourselves and please tell me, Madhi, you are noting, right? Yeah. An additional work, unpaid completely. So you don't and please move around with the mic. I have to tell the amount, I would want to keep and I would want to... Yes, yeah. and please introduce yourself first. I'm Ashika Sadana, studying here in the fourth semester of Development Economics. And uh, I would divide it equally, 50 50. So you want 50 from me and you will also give me 50? I mean, God has given us 100 and we're going to divide it 50 50 between you guys. No, as a proposer and a responder. As a proposer, how much do you propose to give to me? 50. As a responder, how much will you accept from me? 50? Preferably more than that, but 50. 50, at least. Okay. So that's a student of economics responding to you, who's also an Indian. Let, keep on with everybody. It is a, a non anonymous responses. Everybody. My name is Roshni. I'm in fourth semester sociology. Yes. As proposer? I might give 45 rupees. 45? And I might expect something like 60 rupees. 60. Okay. Very good. 45, 60. Uh, I'm Krishna. I'm a student of economics and both semester. And you're from Nepal? Yes. Uh, and the, our early respondent is from India? Nepal. Yes. Nepal. Nepal. I want to uh, keep myself as 80%. You will accept 80. No, I will just have a offer as 20% to you. You will offer me 20, okay? And... Uh, as a respect, I want more than 50%. How much would you want, exactly? Because Madhi is noting numbers. 80%. 80, okay. Okay, so can we... Uh, so we do this randomly now. Can you move uh, to some of our, uh, you know, a different age profile? And here. I'm doing Economics, yes. So uh, for me, I will accept uh, uh, something like 75. For me, uh, I will accept and I, I will give uh, 30. You will give 30, okay. Can we move here to... Uh, yeah. I propose 75 and uh, accept 25. You accept. <laughs> uh, Dr. Sharma. Uh, I would propose to give 50 and I would accept 50. So sweet. 50-50. 50 50. 50, 50. 50, 50. So we are getting 200 altogether. Is that journal? No, it's only page 100. But you and you and me. Like, so and God has given 100 to you and me. But between us. Yes, between us. I think I'll do 50-50. Like, I would, I mean, if, uh, I don't know, I'll offer 50, surely. And but the other guy might uh, ask whatever, uh, I mean, I think I... I am the other guy. Oh. <laughs> if you, if you How much would you be willing to give me? <coughs> ask for 50, right? Oh. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
but I'm a generous guy, so 50-50 either way. <laughs> <laughs> some, some more responses, yes. Ma'am, uh, I will offer one, and I, I, I want to listen again. Oh, wow. <laughs> but that's coming from somebody, okay. We'll discuss right. that. Yeah. Now you're noting some of the results, right? Yeah. Okay. Anybody who's volunteering now to really uh, disclose themselves, as we discussed, disclosure of time. Quickly. I'm Sakshi Abraham, I'm counseling and I'm a songwriter and musician. Yes. So I'm more big hearted than this guy, so I would give you as much as you need. If you ask for 100, I would give it to you. You know that? So how much would you give me? I mean, it depends on your need and if you. No. Look at me on the side. <laughs> It's an all anonymous game. You I see would me. offer you 100% and then uh, ask for it if I need. If you don't have, I'll give you 100%. How much do you accept from me? Except as in, uh, if you have that. Uh, we have know, 100. Yeah. 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 yeah, so it depends on how much I need. If I need 50, I'll ask for 50. How much will you do? This is one shot. You are playing the game. How much I'll, will you accept? I'll, I'll give you 100. Okay. Yeah. 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 It took him was very long to actually ask for interest. I would love to have a lawyer's response actually. So the last one, two more people. Yeah, lawyers. I would, if I was proposing, I would propose 50-50. But if you were proposing, I would take anything greater than zero. Anything greater than zero, right. Ramani? No escape, how much? Oh, we, are, we are pretty objective guys, you know, so we believe in equality. So 50-50, 50-50 either way. Yes, somebody wants to uh, actually... Just to Rustam, yes. I'm from Afghanistan. So I, we should have a marathon or something. So we should earn that, yeah, we need either of us should win. So one of us should get one. So we should have a marathon or something. <laughs> no, you just have to decide that, you know, it's given to us for free by God, just being on earth, it's a terrible place. So, 100 rupees, you decide how much you want and we'll see what happens. So, how much will you give me? Divide. Yes, we need to divide it. If we don't, you see that. If the rejection happens, we get 0-0. Zero, zero. Okay, I will offer you 10%. You'll offer me 10%. And demand you 90%. And demand 90%. So, we have some numbers. We do have numbers of the numbers we have. Can we class them? There are certain, as you see, there are certain numbers which automatically are rising, which are like 50-50. Okay? As a responder, I give you 50. I also accept 50 back. And now, Mali, how many responses do we have like that? Uh, Yoshiko, we have the businessman, we have the Benjit, uh, and the uh, Rock from Right, so of total responses, do a, do a, do a more, we are doing a model analysis here. So of total how many? 30 responses. There is uh, at least 4 responses which are going 50-50. And certain responses where they will give me at least more than 20%. All will give more than 20%, except two people. We have only one unique response from Anish, which is 99.1. Yes. Right? Nobody has given that particular response. So the others, you know, we keep that. You know, we're clubbing responses in groups, which is, you know, economics being what it is. We really love numbers, but it gives some light on what is going on. Okay? We see that at least there's a at least four out of thirteen is coming on to 50-50 share. Right? We haven't taken our entire survey, and it was not uh, you know it was not randomly taken either. We just took, so anyway, it's an interesting thing to note that some people want to do a 50-50, and some people definitely want to do something like I will give you. Some money, but I expect more in return. How many? We do have a whole bunch of responses like that. They, they want a lot back in return. Yes. Right? And they will not give as much. Yes. And there's an extreme, extreme realization of that is I want 99 and I will only give one. Okay? Now let us see how game theory, normal, traditional, neoclassical as we call it, Game theory analyze this game. Okay. 
Now we break up many other things to this because actually I've asked you some leading questions here, but before that, okay? Uh, there are certain hidden assumptions in this game, but first of all, given this, this 50-50 is called what a uh, sense of fair play, a fair share. I give 50, but I also expect 50 back in return. But normal game theory says that is not a rational response. That is not a thinking response. That is a response based on a notion of something like fair play on which economists have very little to offer. And you'll have to fall back also. I'm just okay, so I'm hitting my time limit. So I'll just tell you one thing. The other, this other game that, uh, so we, we have this 99-1 is called the rational response. Because what happens is, as long as you're getting one, you should be happy because what is the worst which will happen? Any rejection by me means that, you know, if you should accept one would be also because if you reject, you get zero. So a thinking response is, you can't do better if you offer me 99. If you keep 99 and offer me only one, I should accept. I should accept. But that sometimes revolts against our sense of fair play. That you are keeping 99 for yourself and you're giving me only one. A nature of governance emerging out of very selfish play where you say, you're keeping 99, you're going to give me one. Whereas to sustain equilibrium outcomes like 50-50, which is fair share, okay, comes from something outside the notion of traditional game theory. The recent research on game theory which starts with evolutionary game theory, which is very current, also tries to say that give up rationality, give up consistency of beliefs. It is seen that as long as you do not bring in certain other notions like what is built into our subconscious mind or unconscious mind in terms of fair play. Okay? Something which comes probably from religion. Do unto others as you would expect them to do unto you. Something which has been evolving over a long period of time as though we have been playing the game for a long period. Certain economies play the game like this, whereas I could have presented some more experimental results uh, uh, which is uh, which is this um, this uh, Machiguenga in Peruvian Amazon. It shows clearly uh, the presence of cultural differences. Okay. Now today we could have actually done a further analysis looking because it was a, I played it non anonymously. Two qualifiers to the game. God is a loaded term, and I said God has given you hundred rupees. To some of us, God means that the moment God is given, it comes with the notion that therefore I have to share. God is given, so as he was saying, it's good, I have to share because it's given by God. The second thing is, you give to me, okay? Me having a face and an appearance, also these are things because we take these finite shapes. You make decisions on how you see me, whereas me dressed in rags, you would probably immediately might also be able to sustain a more fair outcome based on how our mind is perceiving who the proposer is and who the responder is. So uh, the point is the story behind a lot of these responses, which is the outcome of the game, how the governance is played out there, depends really on a lot of philosophy, a lot of socio-cultural factors, which is unfortunately outside economics. So we need to go outside economics to explain essentially economic phenomena to the point that are we really money maximizers or are we maximizers of something else? What are we trying to really do? And do cultural differences or memories or quotes or everything shape and color something which was just a static game like this? Or would actually giving you money change the whole game altogether? So I rest my case with this because I'm out of time. Really sorry. I feel that it is um, it's almost not possible to, uh, or almost not advisable, and I think that, uh, for, for, for me at least, to, uh, to kind of uh, uh, just protect the integrity of this text and say this is the text and that was it. Because 
as uh, philosophies developed. Um, yoga today is, even though it comes from Patanjali, Patanjali has, has been through so many other filters uh, that we cannot escape them. And I also want to say that uh, when I'm talking of yoga, uh, listen about, I mean, hear, hear about what I'm speaking, not as a as a practice <coughs> that you see on television or you know doing asanas and stuff like that. It's not about that at all. It's yoga as a philosophy, uh, which is a very very highly sophisticated philosophy, and it's not about bending backwards or forwards. It's not about that at all. So when I say that the filters it's gone through, it's gone through filters um, um, of uh, tantra. Uh, of um, um, Kashmir Shaivism, of Hadyo, these three main filters uh, that has come through. So it's impossible for me to uh, talk about yoga and say that I agree to Patanjali Yoga uh, and that I somehow have, ma I managed to escape all these other influences which have um, influenced it. I'll begin with, um, with, uh, with the practice of yoga as I see it. Uh, but before that, I also want to say that uh, Patanjali Yoga is called is also called Sankhya Yoga. So I don't know how many of us know Sankhya about, uh, about Sankhya, but we'll just briefly talk about Sankhya. Uh, Sankhya is an 8th century BC uh, philosophy, um, and uh, it's a materialist philosophy. It's called materialist. Why is it materialist? Because it a totally focuses on matter, <coughs> matter which is made up of the Panch tattvas, the five elements. So it's everything emanates out of those five elements. And the, the theory is that matter can be calibrated and can be distilled to spirit. So between earth and ether, everything, everything is possible. So the idea that, again I repeat this, that matter can be distilled unto spirit or essence. That means essence or spirit is a contiguous extension of matter. It's not, a, it's, not a, it's not magic that happens, it's not a grace of God or something. It is materially possible that I can use matter in such a fine manner that I arrive at a state of spirit. And I arrive at the seed, the essence. And that is basically uh, uh, what, the, uh, uh, what this is. So how does it happen? How does how does practice, physical practice that I engage in and I teach, how does that bring this about? Um, yoga, the way we define it, is a practice in which the body, the mind, and the breath work in tandem. And of course, all these three come from uh, the elements. So there are there are lots of trees that work in trees. So the first thing is that it works body, breath, mind together. Because I love to speak in Hindi in uh, They work in tandem. The other thing is that from these five elements that we talk about, um, emanate the five faculties of action, the karma indriyas, then the jnana indriyas, which are the uh, uh, faculties of um, uh, the organs of perception, and then the tanmatras, um, which are the senses. So. That means when I'm practicing, I am creating an activity. I am mindfully acting. I am doing karma, this karma happening. At the same time, it's not random acting. It is orchestrated acting. And I am, at the same time, also observing my action. It's part of, part of practice of yoga is that I'm obs mindfully observing what I'm doing. Yet, subset yoga that you are I'm mindfully observing what I'm and it comes from it's also a very a strong Buddhist influence there. I'm mindfully perceiving what I'm doing. And there is a result to this. If I am mindfully doing something and mindfully observing something, there's an after effect of this. It's like asakota, which is I get absorbed in what I'm doing, and there is a sense of absorption. There's a sense of, um, I, I won't qualify it, but I, I'll talk about it a little later. So there is, so, so practice, a bodily practice of such a kind is that I do, I observe, and I, I experience. And these are, so I, I, I need to, this happens maybe simultaneously or not simultaneously, but this is yoga without these three is not complete. You, the final absorption 
is very very is essential it's critical and this absorption just like you know, some of you practice yoga and there are very very different ways of yoga so at the end of yoga practice there is what we call shavasana so we just we have we have put our bodies through something we have been mindfully observant of what we are doing and when we lie down it's a it's a moment of non doing jabki us cheez ka you get washed with what you have with the effects of what you have done and this experience is categorically an experience of sukh so sukh becomes central to bodily practices <coughs> and this is actually a very revolutionary idea because earlier dukh was the point that you had to kind of no pain no gain was the idea that you have to you have to stand on one leg for 10 years and starve yourself and then maybe you'll achieve something so this has been totally revolutionized and buddha does that and so this becomes a pleasant practice first of all yoga the, the it's a the asana is supposed to be sukha and sthira so the shavasana is where you are in a moment of sukha so i teach this every day i see it happening every day and i can assure you that when you have done a very finely calibrated practice of mind body um uh breath practice you come out of shavasana and for a few hours your state of mind will be different this is a 100% guarantee and something that i keep repeating again and again that you will not bite the bait for those few hours because you will not be you you're feeling too good to destroy it by reacting so and you're not trying to morally police yourself as me and now i'm going to be a good girl or a good boy and I, it's just that you're feeling too good because you have created this juicy chemistry in your body and you're feeling too good to destroy it by reacting so you are actually simplifying your life so to speak so this is this is actually this is and it's happening why because you have materially calibrated your body and the effect is the way you are conducting yourself so this is one what i really want to talk about there are two two terms i want to talk about from the yoga sutras and that will uh, and then we we'll, we'll, uh, and then they kind of uh, later get um, elaborated uh, through other systems as well i want to talk about um the term called vritti vritti is a very very important term but it's um uh, it's, it's it has been mystified so to speak uh the definition of yoga yoga sutra is yoga chitta vritti nirodha ki jo chitta ki vritti hai usko nirodh karna hai usko inhibit karna hai usko band karna hai so people and very people often call vritti as the fluctuation of the mind or the movement of the mind or the turning of the mind but vritti is really a mode we all function from modes and this is what we are talking about we are modes i can be i can be i can live my life as a good boy mode or a bad boy mode or a good girl mode or the victim mode or the um, uh, the aggressive the rebel mode or the uh, devil advocate mode so we all have these modes which are essential to us that when in doubt we get to that mode hum bade acche ban jate hain hum bade bure ban jate hain hum aggressive ban jate hain so these are all these personas that we have it's basically an essential vantage point from where we see the world again and again and again and again and again and again and again it's like hum usi jagah se hamara drishtikon nahi se hota because hum apne aap ko wahan tak so in a way we have arrested ourselves into our mode and yoga the practice is to somehow become mode free that some somehow you shed this mode and say wow life is bigger and fuller than what i have been find myself to life is good life is fun life is beautiful so this vritti is is actually the target of this body practice that how do i somehow shed this vritti how do i um detach myself from my vritti so i can examine it um or let it go i'm going to put this aside i won't go any further but i just want to share that it's it's about this and why i'm choosing vritti is that vritti is something that vritti fixes you i'm fixed and if i'm fixed the scope of play becomes very very diminished because i can only play one character and i don't know how to play out my play myself out of it but the whole idea of so uh, 
of, of, of practice is play. But I also want to say that in the Yoga Sutra model, the play is very subtle. The play is, uh, it's not um, a lush play as it develops later on in say Tantra or Shadism. Because the, the, because the equation between the two, say Purusha and Pratiti, uh, the equation keeps changing. So in this Purusha Pratiti, the idea is that there are two entities, Purusha and Pratiti, and the ideal state is not of union between the two, which is popularly considered to be, you know, yoga is union with God, a union with something. It, it is not. The ideal state of yoga is where Purusha and Prakriti are distinctly separate. Where Prakriti realizes its mood. Apna jab wo mood pachan de, pachan de hai, wo uski, uh, idealized state hai. There is proximity between the two. They radiate upon within each other. They radiate influence, but they are distinctly separate. So this equation keeps changing as we go along, and that that determines the play between them. But the idea that the seed of this play is in this, it's very subtle and it comes from detachment. It is because the, the, if there is no detachment, there is no play. You have to detach yourself from your fixed britti, so to speak, in order to get into play and say, I will do something else. So there is, a, there is a separation between your definition and but, uh, uh, detachment or vairagyam is an integral part of practice. So uh, when they say keep uh, yoga to practice kya hai, Patanjali says it is a practice which has abhyas and vairagyam. And he says that in the same sutra. So that means in the same breath he is proposing a practice which is exerted practice but with vairagyam, with detachment. So it's this detachment which allows you later on to break free and become playful. So, this one side. The other uh, um, term that I want to uh, bring into the picture is Pragnya. Pragnya again is a, is a very, very important term, but it has again become very mystified and not easily understood. I mean, in the world, they have wisdom. Wisdom is a very generic, very vague thing, you know, wisdom. And wisdom also is It's something like that. Pragnya, first of all, Pragnya is. And intelligence, let's call it intelligence right now, that, that results out of practice, out of material. It's not, it's not, the, it, it's not an idea to an idea kind of intelligence. It's something that you, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's something that you put yourself through some, something, some practice um, of a, a practice of give and take, a practice of trial and error, and bingo, the penny drops. Pratnya is the penny dropping. It is insight. Pratnya is not uh, koi, koi jo, padhi hai, or padhi or gaya, grand kar diya. Nahin. Pratnya is yours. Pratnya is uniquely yours. Pratnya gives you such great autonomy because this is the same thing. This is the same thing. So they, it, it has a concreteness to it because. Pragna is because of what you have put yourself through and bingo, it has revealed something. It's a penny dropping. And what happens is that the penny drops, uh, this is my analogy, as a, as a, as a, as a theatre person, this is my analogy, the penny drops and suddenly aapka jo asmaan hai, aapki dimaan ka asmaan hai, which Tantra calls Bodh Gagan, which is a beautiful term, the sky of the mind. Ek tara jal jata hai, you know, a star shine begins to appear because you have insight and that insight star appears. Other penny drops, there's another star, and there's another star, and these stars begin to make, and a whole alternative reality begins to come into play, begins to come into being, because of physical practice, not because of the apne vichar kiya hai, socha hai, ya apko sikhaya gaya hai, ya apne kuch kiya hai. It is your, it is your, it is, and in fact, I just love this last sutra in the, in the first chapter where just before he defines the highest form of samadhi, which is nirbhiji samadhi, just before that he says, um, uh, So the windfall of pragnya, the whole sky, your both gagan becomes studded with all these inside stars. And that's when your 
your inner reality becomes complete and you have reached the highest form of Samadhi. So it is, it's populating your inner being, the both gardens, so to speak, with insight. An insight that happens not because of following the dotted line. It doesn't happen from being the obedient student or being the good boy or the good bad girl or whatever. It is by playing. It is trial and error. It is experimenting. Basically, yoga is experiment. Yeah, experiment kya hota hai? You do something and then you watch. And you allow this to do whatever it will do. You don't control it. You have given into the play of this chemical that you have done something to. So this is the practice that you do and you watch and say, ah, yes. And then you build, so it's a building on something. So you allow other things to be rather than control them. Um, how much time do I have? So I'm going to I'm going to again set this aside, and then I just want to kind of deviate a little bit and say that um, this uh, 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 I, I mentioned a little bit of sukh. This sukh ke bina nahi hota. This is this is this this play, this comfort. This play comes up out of the luxury of comfort, luxury of sukh when you can be luxuriously entertaining an alternative reality. It's a luxury. And it's a luxury that we can all and we should actually, I should is a bad word, allow ourselves. So this, this idea of sukh becomes um, uh, very, very um, uh, uh, central and it keeps, I, I just want to quickly talk about it. it. It develops into many other things and then it gets into aesthetics and poetics. Uh, so uh, in Kashmir Shabdan and uh, uh, Kup, uh, it comes into um, uh, Vimash, Vishanti, Anand and finally Shantras. I don't want to talk about Shantras, but Shantras is an incredible introduction. It's a revolution, rev revolutionary idea. Just as Sukh is revolutionary, um, which Buddha introduced, the idea of Shantras revolutionizes uh, aesthetics. And not just that, then within um, uh, Kashmir Shaivism, uh, the ideal spiritual experience becomes intrinsically it ha poetic. That spirituality is not just, spirituality is intrinsically poetic, spirituality is intrinsically aesthetic. I mean, it's such a fantastic idea that it's not a dry clinical affair. It is a juicy, satisfying, resonant, um, uh, and what is poetry? Um, that it, it kind of it it is it talks it makes reality into a into an alternative reality. Um, I want to so I'm I'm saying that there is there is there are I just can regress my steps. So there is sukh, there is detachment, there is pragya, there is uh, the play with vritti to disable. The idea is to disable vritti. कि आप अपने आप को इस तरह का सुख देना शुरू करो कि जब आप एक सुखी वातावरण से अपने आप को देखोगे तो बोलोगे भैया इसको जाने देना इस आदत को जाने दे इस वृत्ति को जाने दे बिकॉज इट्स 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 टू आई आई बिलीव टू गुड टू होल्ड ऑन टू दिस पेटी स्टांस इट्स अ स्टांस वृत्ति इज अ स्टांस एंड सो इट्स इट्स एन इक्वेशन ऑफ सेटिस्फाइंग द सेल्फ टू अ डिग्री और अ डेली डोज दैट यू यू लेट गो so there is this thing of or what I want to finally talk about is that this whole play of what I've just said, Vritti, Sukh, um, is not just um, has a very has one more very in, 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 part, very important element, and that's an element of surprise. It is not so this is when pragna happens, it's a it's a happy accident. You know, this is something. So this element of surprise is a very very important element, which happens only in play. It cannot be when you when you when you receive when you arrive at a calculated result. There is no surprise. No, the one I thought two plus two four one I thought four years after that, five years after that, it happened. It is. When two and two things mix and you have no idea, you let them play and you've allowed yourselves to stay detached and yet involved, 
something happens. And I want to just kind of conclude by, 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 by giving two examples. The first example is Valmiki. When he writes, he's the Adi Kavi, and Ramana, Ramayana is the Adi Kavya. So when he writes the Adi Shlok, his first his response is, Kill me them. He says, Yeh kya Yeh mene kya ho diya? So he's the he's stunned at not just um, his capacity to be a poet, but he's also stunned at the capacity of language to be poetic. And that's where grammar graduates into poetry. It's the beginning of so it's it's a it's a revelation. So there is a so this moment of of this play is full of surprises. And I want to conclude by uh, quoting. Um, the opening text, the opening sutra of a text that I recently studied, and it's it's a it's a 12th century text. It's only 13 sutras. It's a jewel of a, of a text. Um, it's called um, uh, Abhatula Nata Sutrani. And the first text says, the first sutra says, the first of the 13 sutras says, Maha Sahasa Vritti Parupyam Labham. Maha Sahasa. So it's made up. It, it is written that Vritti and Sarup are Texts are words that have come from the Yoga Sutras. Not that they are endorsing Yoga Sutras. Vritti is Vritti. And uh, the, second, uh, the, the second sutra is of Yoga Sutras is uh, Yoga Chitta Vritti Nirodaha. The third sutra is Tadha Drishtu Swarupam Avasthanam. So, Uswak, Jab Vritti Nikal Jati hai, jab the, when the stances disappear, you arrive in your Swarup, in your sense of self, your Asmita. Your, your, you become whole. Let's not talk too much about it. So, the, this sutra. In the 12th century, says Maha Sahasa Vrittaya Swarupam Lava. Maha Sahasa. Sahasa is so jata. Sahasa is so good. Achan. Sahasa is so good. So, Maha Sahasa. Maha Sahasa Vrittaya. So, Jab Jab and Jab Apna Aap Milta hai, but it's a great, happy, sudden event. But the sahasa is not just sahasa, the sahasa also has the play of sahas. So it is a moment of courage, great courage and great surprise. So courage and surprise are also intrinsically involved because if there is no courage, there is no play. You, it, it requires a bit of a recklessness, a bit of a courage to step into, like I am a dancer, I am an actor, I know what courage it takes to step out of Naptej to become somebody else. It requires courage. It requires playful courage, but it requires courage. Sabke bas ka kam nahi hai. Acting karna sabke bas ka nahi hai. Kyunki people want to stay, people want to hang on to what they are. They don't know how, they don't have the courage, literally. Don't step out of it. So, I just want to end with this. Maha Sahasa Swarupam Vritti. So that means he is, he is, as opposed to Yoga Sutras, which says, Chitta Vritti Nirodaha, ki Vritti ko nirodh karo, Vritti ko inhibit karo, he says, nirodh karne ki zorut nahi hai. Replace it by a sahasa vritti. A vritti of play, courage and deliverance into surprise. Ki surprise me ya. So to be available at that edge, to be surprised. So that is, that is a vritti, that is a, that is a stance that I can, I can deliver myself into. To be, to say, how they take care of that. So, so there's a courage and there's a in, there's a there's a there's a, um, um, a, 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 a an invitation to play. So um, I, I guess that's um, what I'd like to um, end with. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, what? Uh, if we have questions from the audience, please feel free. Yes. Oh, I'm sorry, it's really late to have no, no. questions. No. Um, my question, uh, I have two questions. Uh, I can have Devdatta's question a little later, probably in one of the exchanges that we have almost on a daily basis on the corridor on the campus. But then I don't think I would get to meet Adrian so often, so I have a question for Adrian. 
Uh, Adrian, I am a student of the Advaita philosophy of Shankara. And I also read a little of uh, the Vaishnavite uh, understandings. Now, it, what intrigued me about what you said was that you used the word Krida as in the context of the Shaivite philosophy. Um, it actually put me on a little of a surprise because I thought Krida was better personified in the Vaishnavite philosophy in the idea of the Madhura Bhakti of the gopis. Yes. Or rather as uh, she started out when she said, uh, as play, I would rather call it as Hela. Yeah. Right? So I, I'm still wondering how do I position a Krida? Uh, because when I read uh, Saundarya Lahari I, or Shankara or probably, um, you know, the Dakshinamurti Stotra, I would rather more find a worship to reach yeah. the Atman yeah. than uh, something like, uh, you know, Seeing these two, the the Purusha and the Atman, as two different things was what the Vaishnavite philosophy talked about. So I don't really understand why you put the yeah. Krida there. Yeah. yeah. Well, first of all, you you're right. We are right um, for two reasons. Uh, first of all, I think uh, Krida is, is a word that appears much earlier because uh, it's a Vedic word and um, it develops uh, throughout centuries and it ends, well it doesn't end but it's also used and one of the authors that also used this word is Anyanagupta, you know, so uh, that's why I said Shaivism, uh, even if Danielu didn't pay attention to that word, I mean he, he, he mentions Leela but uh, he resorts to Vaishnavic sources in order to uh, thematize this problematic now, you're right that in the concept of worship, the thing would be, uh, should be placed in another uh, perspective. But uh, why, what I wanted to emphasize is the idea, there is, there is one idea that calls my attention, that, that, that is, I think, in the, late, in the last exposition, it appears uh, in a very clear light, and at the same time, it deviates a little bit, because we have, you spoke about, uh, practice, you know, and uh, if we have practice as a way of deconditioning oneself, it's, I mean, we are playing of course, we can say that we're always playing, but we have a technique of deconditioning ourselves from something. And what I thematized when I spoke about Danilo is something that is, in this sense, it is uh, separated from this kind of interpretation, yoga tradition and all that. But I said Krida because Aminabhagupta uses this word and uses this word in a very special context of the play of three worlds, Trika, and in Trika Shaivism. And uh, I think that even if Danilu didn't mention that, that is a very important point because Lila is at least one big part of the scholarship, considers that Lila is, uh, belongs to the Shaivism, to the uh, Vaishnavi tra uh, tradition. And I think that. Two, two things. I, I think Shaivism is also part, takes uh, part in this uh, debate about the meaning of, of Lila. And the second thing is that we don't only find one word. I mean, Lila is one word of defining or trying to define this cosmic play. But there are other words. Lila is one, one word that is not Lila, but it belongs to the same semantic field. And that begins with the thematization of Agni, or with, even with, with I spoke about erotic metaphors, uh, also in Rig Veda, you know? There are erotic, uh, comp in, the, in the ritual of Soma, for example, you know, the distillation, you use distillation of milk and water, and this, this idea of uh, penetrating and infusing something, and I think these are all metaphors of something, that lies even beyond the, the thought of deconditioning through another type of conditioning. There is, there is one level of the reflection that I wanted to introduce. But you are absolutely right that it, it doesn't, it's not limited to one of the, other, or the other tradition. And it's a problem also to distinguish semantically and also relate it. Uh, relate uh, semantically. I, I am 
in favor of relating, even with the proper distinction, but relating semantic fields according to context, because I find many patterns, <coughs> you know? I don't know whether that answers your question. But <coughs> it answers your question. Any other question? Please do be free to ask, no problem. So we can have maybe some reactions from the speakers. Uh, I, know, I have one, one quick question and then we can uh, It's about this conditioning. Like, uh, how, because you're talking about governance, I have this concern about, uh, you know, I, I just want to bring this to that, that discourse to see how uh, these concepts that we discussed, you know, apparently very dis distinct fields. And one, one important, significant aspect that all the speakers talked about is this deconditioning, you know, this closure, um, uh, kind of breaking the habit. Uh, you know, surprise, the courage to do it, etc., to create an alternative reality. So the possibility of creating an alternative reality, which is uh, absolutely insightful, uh, you know, beautiful, which gives suk etc. So it's a kind of like you're move, all moving towards that aspect of governance, which will uh, uh, help us arrive at this, this kind of thing. So that movement is very clear. But my concern is about this, like this we have seen repeatedly in the history of uh, civilizations, especially in the history of ideologies, where you, know, you come up with a certain kind of methodology of conditioning, practice, which ultimately ends up as another habit. You know, how do we counter this? You know, if you have, because you know, in this particular, at this particular juncture, when we had a history of ideologies uh, re uh, reaching to that kind of a situation. We've had uh, uh, numerous examples in history. So at this point, if we are really thinking very deeply about this, then we, I think we should be aware of the danger of this and try to reflect a bit on this. Can I just ask you one question? And ask you, um, when you're trying to bring this whole thing around to find new governments, and I mean, my on trade to governance is really Mahabharata and uh, not so much the Ramayana, but the Arthi Shastra or Mahabharata, more Mahabharata. In this whole discourse in the Shanti Parva or Anushasana Parva or anything like that, where Yudhishthira is actually being told how to govern, or even in Krishna's discourse, there is no question of arriving at a Sukha. That Sukha is an individual Sukha, but it is not related to governments. Even the Janak um, myth, legend, whatever, ideal, is actually broken in that because he's found to be wanting. So even his detachment, attachment kind of a thing is found to be wanting. So I don't understand how you can bring these all into the theory of Sukha. Sukha is something different. Uh, I, I think I'll try to answer this. Like it is not a, uh, uh, when we're talking about so it is not. A, uh, uh, I also want to bring this question to the idea of play, where we have generally a, a, a conception that play is a very delightful exercise. The other day we were having this uh, this this uh, conversation among ourselves about play, the play field being a place where you you fall down and sprain your leg, you do a lot of there is there are a lot of other active, uh, you know, painful things, so-called painful things exist. Yes, so many things. But so for the same reason, when we are talking about this particular soup, particular soup, we are actually bringing the attention back to the individual. It is not actually about you know the, the whole concept of like the general soup for everyone is a myth. So we are trying to demythify that and try to bring the attention back to the individual who will work out his soup. You know, it is so, the, any governance model which will not uh, pay its attention on the individual is, is not likely to survive in these times because we've had ideologies which were mm -hmm. talking about. Yeah. There are lots of things yeah. you can say about yeah. that. Yeah. So that is, the, so we are trying to bring the attention back to the participant, the, the individual, who will work out a particular kind of soup. So his soup is different from somebody else's. Yeah. 
there was a question over there. Uh, I think you said. Um, oh, okay, sorry. Can I just go back to the earlier because it was part of my what, thing that I was yeah. talking about. Yeah. So I think that of how to how to uh, bring this down to so whatever this experience of a particular of, 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 of personal suk and a practice uh, is and how to bring it down to uh, governance. Um, it's a question that I've been kind of trying to deal with, but I but also I think one reason that maybe none of us focus is because it's it's a very it's a very daunting thing to certainly talk of governance because it's 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 too big for me to talk of governance. Who am I? But on the other hand, um, on a very uh, personal level. Um, I feel that the, the place where we are today in history, um, it is that we have uh, uh, ideas have run us into the ground. It's time to it's time to kind of you know look at matter. So literally, there is if we just follow this trajectory of matter, when matter shall be. You know, if I if I look at matter, uh, like yoga says, if you, if you if you pay attention to something, if you attend upon something, that something will begin to heal, that something will begin to be, that something will begin to tell a story. And it's time for us to really listen to the story of stuff that's around us, which we have just you know I mean, we have we have I mean as a culture we have become so incredibly disrespectful of matter, so incredible. I can talk about this for hours. And you know the reasons why this has, but it is criminal the way we are disrespecting matter of any kind. And I just can go to a very, 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 very uh, um, uh, a close example of the earth, uh, where the way we are treating the land, just the land. Um, I work in um, uh, villages, and um, uh, this woman comes up to me in Punjab, uh, 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 and she says, "You know, हमारे तो हमारी ज़मीन और हमारे आदमी दोनों शराबी को." that our land and our men have both become alcoholics. The land doesn't yield till you actually pump in pesticides and all this stuff into it, the toxins into it, and the men are all alcoholics. So it is, it is because it begins from, if there is, if we see something going wrong, it is actually begin because we have stopped loving matter. And, and we, I don't have to give you any more examples, look at the air we breathe, look at the Yamuna, look at the, look at, just step outside and just see, you know, what we, are, how incredibly disrespectful we, we are contentious of matter. And yet, uh, because we think, because why? I tell you why, because we think somehow, that somehow an idea will save us. I mean, this is the fantasy we live in, that some idea is going to come and save us. I'm sorry, there's no idea that's going to save us. It's literally, I mean, I mean, matter ki pooch pakadi padegi to able to to recreate reality, so to speak. It is, it is a material world, and material is, matter is not a dirty word. Um, so there is, um, so I think this is, I mean, if, if when it comes to governance, um, it's again not. I'm not talking about governance from the Prime Minister, but governance from me uh, of how I begin to deal with matter and how I begin to engage with matter. And how do, I, how, do I, how do I begin to examine my duty towards matter? Um, my, 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 and it's, it's a combination of many things. It's a combination of, um, one, you know, this whole idea that matter doesn't matter. That's also a very Indian idea. It's a very religious, it's not a yogic idea, but it's a very religious idea that matter to interior, matter to maya, matter to janito, matter to kyanto. It's one thing. And this, this coupled with capitalism, which is, you know, uh, use and throw. Um, this is a, Take the population, it's killed us. So, uh, matter doesn't matter, and matter doesn't matter, on both of you, you know? Um, on either, so it's, it's a lose-lose situation on both ends. And uh, I think we have to really um, pull up our socks. It's high time, because uh, to, to look at matter and... Matter does matter. Matter, <laughs> matter is beautiful and matter matters. And matter is the only thing that matters. What I didn't do and left is a bit blank is on this perspective of governance emerging naturally out of a game. It is what, the kind of game that I told you, yielding two separate classes of equilibria effectively. One is a fair kind of what is appealing to us, to our sense of fair play, and the other is something that we don't really like, okay, that is a kind of uh, rational equilibrium. Now, in deconstructing these equilibria, where will, can we self-govern our 
ourselves to come to one of these two equilibria. Now the sad thing is when you do evolutionary game theory, you come to, you have to look at the brain as it has involved, the human brain. Unfortunately, to add to what he's saying, human existence in evolutionary time scale, which is a very long time scale, human beings as we are, we have existed for a very small period of time. Okay? We are just a blip in that evolutionary map. Okay? Now we have evolved, we have reptilian memories. Okay? There is an R complex in the brain, and I'm collaborating with a friend of mine who is uh, from Biotech. And uh, there are interesting structures in the brain, which are, one is this, uh, he told me, he introduced me to this concept, bilateral anterior insula, which give rise to the flight and fright, you know, when in any game situation. First thing, when, I, when somebody says that, you know, I expect more from you than what I will give. Because there are certain things, if I do not, what will I be perceived to be later? I will be perceived to be who's always accepting less and less and maybe less Fear-driven reactions, you know, but that is pre-built programming, as you're saying, for conditioning, prior conditioning of years of survival of having for dinosaurs, of having not having resources or technology through which a human existence has evolved. Now, this kind of deconditioning or moving away from this kind of anterior, what he calls bilateral anterior <coughs> insula, to the prefrontal cortex, which takes this kind of decision, which is very, you know, rational by taking, you know, a kind of perspective that I am playing the game and yet I am an observer in the game. Will on an evolutionary scale that develop in that part of the brain to come up and play the game like that probably will take millennia. Will take millennia. I don't know whether doing yoga actually changes the neurotransmitters in the brain and makes us someone who is willing to give 50-50, he apparently does. So, Maybe there is something to it. But there might be physical practices which are now changing the neurotransmitters in the brain so that the same game we play differently. Because uh, as I was telling you, there's an interesting experiment done by the Machiguenga Indians who expect, who will accept that ninth one, but who will also want to give very little. Because they have been exposed very little to the trading culture. Whereas the exposition to anything that, you know, in doing international trade, and I accept matter isn't bad, but therefore the loaded term of capitalism is also not a good idea. Because what happens as we keep interacting with each other, a social epistemology emerges, a, a rule of the game that you understand and I understand. And both of us understand that playing a 99-1, one, one is most likely is bad and to be rejected. And these are conditioning unless they are built into the, you're not looking at outcomes which are self-governing and leading to a no market, no government, because everyone is finally tied down to the way the brain is and the, the R. So by denying our existence as people who are animals, and we are projecting ourselves like gods who can, you know, uh, somehow take uh, observer's look, but when we were playing that game, we were in the game. Then it's very hard to be an observer, particularly in an economic game. So my thing is, it's slightly pessimistic. Right? <laughs> no, but uh, I think it is, you don't have to call it pessimistic. But it's, you know, there might be an experiment like what uh, yes, uh, yeah, the yeah. is doing. Something like that. Yeah. Because uh, yes. uh, there are a few questions in the audience or so. So okay. how would you? <laughs> okay, it's, it's, it, we, we will start. Is there? Quickly, quickly. You done? Uh, Be behind, yeah. Yeah. If we could just uh, mention those two questions very, very briefly in uh, one or two minutes, please. I mean, I don't know, it just, it was a thought that came to me that when we're talking about all of these, they're not 
So, um, independent of individual, as we might like them to believe, but, you know, or we might believe them to believe, but they're probably, uh, you know, we, we're missing perhaps an overarching sphere of influence that is constantly feeding the receivers and enactors and, uh, you know, involved with that, and then bring this into our lives and then relay that in different ways and be able to choose to within the sphere. Yeah, this. Yeah, just to make it short, uh, you know, uh, uh, the, the, your uh, this experiment, which was very, uh, I mean, it, it, it sort of gave this insight that you also brought up about how economics actually, in a way, is about ignoring all of it. You know, it assumes this sort of rational human being, which in reality we are not rational in that sense. We're, we're willing to share and things like that. But economics has such a strong hold on, on on the world today, and in many ways, that's why we're leading. We, we're going to this. It's almost suicidal the sort of things we are doing. You know, we it's you feel as if you have to keep growing as a country. I mean, you need to keep. You have to focus on GDP because that's how you'll get investment. Because people will think this is a great place to put your money. So you have to keep and to help with whatever you know happens to the people. Uh, you, you, that, you know, so it's this kind of ignoring our uh, heritage, I'll say, our sort of human heritage of And uh, just focusing on being rational, that is in many, leading to this kind of, uh, what is almost suicide. I mean, what we're doing to uh, kind of change or to the earth and things like that. So it's very uh, interesting point that you Thank you very much. I hope, uh, thank you very much for this. This is really insightful for us to take this uh, thing forward. And uh, thank you very much, all the three of you. Uh, this has been really... Mesmerizing concept. Absolutely. Okay. And I wish we had more time. Like, we should devise uh, formats which will allow us to have, like, you know, this deeper kind of uh, conversations. Maybe we can think about this. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh,